Hello, testing, one, two, three, you hear me? Well, good morning for the third time. <laughs> you guys doing well? Seems like more of you guys came in, so now I can ask you that, and you guys can respond. <laughs> um, well, today I'm going to be speaking, as you guys can see, and a couple of weeks ago I spoke on identity to the youth group. Is this mic okay? Is it ringing? Buzzing? Sorry. Well, I spoke on identity to the youth group a couple weeks ago, and as you can imagine, in the teen years, that's where people struggle with identity the most, you know, and I think, I was thinking about identity and how to tie that in with adults, because, you know, you guys are just grown-up youth, and you guys, <laughs> you know, you guys may seem like you have it all together, but maybe you guys have problems too, I don't know, but... You know, we all have a hard time figuring out who we are sometimes. And so, with the youth, we took a look at Peter and how he found his identity in Christ. Now, I think a lot of you know your identity. You guys might know that it should be in Christ. But maybe you still don't really know who you are or what you're doing here or what your purpose is here in life. And this is a dangerous place to be because... You know, that this can lead us to becoming stagnant, just staying uh, in one spot and not really moving to forward in the Lord. And that's not how Christianity is supposed to be. So I, I want to really ask you guys just to be thinking about this. Do you really believe, like Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2.9, which calls you a chosen people, royal priest, and God's very own possession? Do you believe that you were created in his image and that he has adopted you into his family? But before we start answering these questions, I want to take a look at Peter. You know, he's a pretty relatable guy. He's probably like a lot of you and me. Sometimes he puts his foot in his mouth. He says the wrong things. And even though he does that, even though he had those failures and those stumblings, he was able to stay strong in the Lord because the Lord was faithful to him. And I want, I want to point out that the Lord, he's been faithful to all of you and to me as well. Just think about your life. He's always been there with you. He even prays for us since by his grace that we are here. He lives to intercede and pray for us. And the Father hears him. Like Peter, when Jesus asked the disciples, he said, would you pray with me? Would you stay up and pray with me? And it seems like sometimes our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. But God knows the questions. He knows the doubts in our mind. He knows what we're struggling with. And he went through this life as a human, too. And he'll help us through those things. So before we get deeper into God's word, I want to pray a blessing on this time. So let's bow our heads. Dearly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this great morning, God. Lord, we just come before you as humble, as creatures of you, God. You're our creator, and you made us all, and we're here to glorify you, God. We're here to give you praise. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in each and every one's life. Even if people have felt like you've rejected them, that you failed them, we know, God, that you haven't, and we know that we can be here and we are here because of you. You've drawn us here, God. So I pray that you would anoint my tongue, God. Speak through me. I pray that every word I say is from you, God, and that you would uh, just speak any rain of words that you want me to tell your people, and that their hearts would be open, that their hearts, uh, you would just plow up the hard ground, God, so that the seed can take root and grow deep in their hearts. I thank you, Father, that you're a God of love and that you love us unconditionally as we're singing. I pray, Father, that we would know what that means, that we would love you back with everything that we have. And I thank you for this time, and we pray a blessing on this study. It's in Jesus' my name I pray. Amen. So, as I was saying, we've been studying Second Peter with the youth group. And in the first chapter, we saw that Peter says that it's not just from Peter, but he says it's from Simon Peter. In his first book, he just says it's from Peter. But in his second book, he calls himself Simon Peter. And I believe he does this because it's toward the end of his life. 
And he knows, you know, he's saying that he knows where he's been. He knows where he would be if it wasn't for Jesus. If you guys know, Simon means shifting sand, which is unpredictable. It's flaky. You can't trust it. You can't build a house on it. You know, this guy was showing me a picture of a castle on a sand on sand yesterday, and it, all the sand around it was, uh, was just taken away, and it was like on this little pillar of sand. And that's, that's what Simon kind of meant. But in John 1.42, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. He, he's basically saying, You may be shifting sand now, but you'll be rocky. Not the rocky, not the boxer, but you know, you'll, be, you'll be strong. You'll be a rock. So if you guys want to turn to Matthew 16, now's the time. So Matthew 16, 16 through 19. And Kevin asked me um, what the title of my message was today. And I was like, oh, I don't have a title. <laughs> but what did you put up there? No, he didn't make it up. <laughs> I just made it up. But it's knowing your identity in Christ. So this sermon is on identity and how, you know, how Peter found it in Christ and how we are supposed to. So Matthew 16, 16 through 19. All right, so it says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So we see here that this was a change from shifting sand to rock. This was the change in Peter's life when he, be, he finally understood who Jesus was. And he understood it by revelation from the Father. So he got the revelation from God and he spoke out. He said, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. You're the one that we can put all our faith, all our trust, all our hope in. And that moment when he realized who Jesus was, that's when he found his true identity. So many people are not secure in their, who they are because they're not sure who they are. And it might just sound like I just repeated myself there, but... Listen, it says, so many people are not secure in who they are <clears throat> because they are not sure who they are. You might say, oh, that's only true for teens, but it also happens in people like your guys' ages, <laughs> you know, or in their 40s and 50s, you know, they just call it midlife crisis now. <laughs> but no matter who you are or what age you are, you'll be unsure who you are if you you don't know why you exist if you don't know Jesus personally. And if that relationship isn't alive, you know, we can't just know him, but we need to know him personally. So when I was a chaplain at Push Ridge, you know, many people wanted us to speak on identity. And they wanted us to uh, speak on that because in high school, like I was saying, and in middle school, a lot of people are struggling with that at that time. They're trying to figure out who they are, why they exist, but the sad thing is that I saw many of them trying to find their identity in things apart from Christ. And that's what seemed to confuse them. When any one of us tries to find out who we are apart from God, we'll either be depressed or we'll realize that we're nothing without Him and turn to Him. Still, there are many people trying to figure out who they are apart from Christ, and some of them go on and on trying to figure out, striving to find themselves in other things. They find themselves, try to find themselves in momentary things, and then they do this even until death. But the man who comes to the end of himself, the man who realizes his need for God, he is the one who is blessed. As it says in Matthew 5.3, God blesses those who are poor, or other versions say poor in spirit, and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Once we come to this realization, our lives should change. We need to realize that nothing in this world can give us value. Our value comes from the Lord. 
and we are created for his pleasure and for his purposes. So when we know his love for us and that we are to love him back, then we'll know why we exist. And that's what our purpose is, why we exist. Just as nothing in this world will give us value, nothing, you know, nothing will give us value besides Jesus. Some of you may look back at your life, you may think, oh, my, my past, it was just a failure. Or you may even feel unworthy right now, even though the blood of Christ has made you worthy. So if you claim to be unworthy now that you're in Christ, then you're denying the saving work of Christ in your life. You and I are worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and because of that we are called to holy living. We're not called to keep on sinning. We're not called to trample upon His grace. But once we're in that, once His blood has covered us, we're called to holy living. I like the story about the man who was found beaten behind a Burger King dump- dumpster. I don't like the story, but I like how he was learning how to find his identity. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but it was back in 2004, and you know he just woke up behind a dumpster, and he didn't know who he was. All he knew was his first name, Benjamin, and he didn't know his social or anything. So that just imagine that. If you were if you just woke up behind a dumpster, not knowing who you were. The great news for us though is that no matter where we came from or no matter who we are, no matter what our past was like, God is calling us to find out who we are in Him. He's our true Father and He knows He has a great plan and a great inheritance for us. <clears throat> I want to read you guys a story. It's a it's a pretty cool story because I was looking up uh, who this man was, and it seemed like he was a, it said he was a real man. So let me read it to you. <laughs> Too sorry. <laughs> a seminary professor was vacationing with his wife in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. One morning they were eating breakfast at a little restaurant, hoping to enjoy a quiet meal. While they were waiting for their food, they noticed a distinguished looking white haired man moving to the table. You know, he was moving from table to table, visiting with the guests. The professor leaned over and whispered to his wife, I hope he doesn't come over here. But sure enough, the man did come over to their table. Where are you folks from? He asked in a friendly voice. Oklahoma, they answered. Great to have you here in Tennessee, the stranger said. What do you do for a living? I teach at a seminary, he replied. Oh, so you teach preachers how to preach, do you? Well, I've got a really great story for you. And with that, the gentleman pulled up a chair, sat down at the table with the couple. The professor groaned and thought to himself, great, just why I need another preacher story. <laughs> the man started, see that mountain over there, pointing at the, out the restaurant window. Not far from the base of that mountain, there was a boy born to an unwed mother. He had a hard time growing up because every place he went, He was always asked the same question, hey boy, who's your daddy? Whether he was at school, in the grocery store, the drug store, people would ask him the same question, who's your daddy? He would hide at recess and lunchtime from the other students. He would avoid going into stores because that question hurt him so bad. When he was about 12 years old, a new preacher came to his church. He would always go in late and slip out early to avoid hearing the question, who's your daddy? But one day, the new preacher said a benediction so fast and he got caught and had to walk out with the crowd. Just about the time he got to the back door, the new preacher, not knowing anything about him, put his hand on his shoulder and he asked him, son, who's your daddy? The whole church got deathly quiet. He could feel every eye in the church looking at him. Now everyone would finally know the answer to the question, who's your daddy? This new preacher, though, sensed the situation around him and using discernment that the only Holy Spirit could give, said to the following to that scared little boy, wait a minute, he said, I know who you are. I see the family resemblance now. You are a child of God. With that, he patted the boy on his shoulder and said, boy, you've got a great inheritance. Go and claim it. With that, the boy smiled for the first time in a long time. 
and walked out the door a changed person. He was never the same again. Whenever anybody asks him, who's your daddy, he just tell them, I'm a child of God. The distinguished gentleman got up from the table and said, isn't that a great story? The professor responded, that is a really great story. As the man turned to leave, he said, you know, if that preacher hadn't told me that I was one of God's children, I probably never would have amounted to anything. And he walked away. The seminary professor and his wife were stunned. He called the waitress over and asked her, do you know who that man was? Um, where am I? <laughs> and he, yeah, do you know who that man was? The waitress grinned and said, of course, everybody here knows him. That's Ben Hooper, the two-term governor of Tennessee. Now, I love this story because, like I said, it's true, but because he was actually a governor in Tennessee in the early 1900s. But besides that, this story shows us that God has great plans for us, and we can claim you know, that inheritance once we find our identity in him. Now, I'm not saying like preaching prosperity doc doctrine where you just claim whatever you want. But, you know, he has given us an inheritance. He has given us a purpose in our lives. <clears throat> that might be different for each of us, you know. Not everyone's going to be a governor. Some of us might even be called to live in a shack and preach to people and to further his kingdom and give him glory. But that's still fulfilling your purpose. When I wasn't drawing close to the Lord, you know, when I was younger, you know, I was confused and I was overwhelmed, you know, just kind of going through the motions and not really knowing what I'm doing. But it's such a relief when you place your identity in Christ, when you know why you exist, because he knows you better than anyone, you know. He knows what you're supposed to do and what he's created you to do. So you guys might not know, hopefully you still, you know, your name or something, but... You might not know why you're here still. You might just be going through the motions. You might just be in a job not knowing why you're there. But, you know, we're all here to preach the gospel. We're all here to fulfill God's plan for us. And he called us to the Great Commission to go out and spread the news. So wherever you are, you can be doing that. So when you and I, when we realize that the world doesn't revolve around us, that God doesn't exist for us, that's when, that's when we know who we are in the big picture of life. That's not all about us. It's for God. Colossians 1.16 says that everything was created through him and for him. And Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. You and I need to know that we exist to please Christ, and it's not the other way around. God doesn't exist to bring us a husband or a wife or to give us a good job. He doesn't exist to give you everything you crave. No, we exist for him. This day exists for him, and so does everything in it. When that revelation finally sinks in, we find our identity in God. <clears throat> you, know, it's, you could say, my house... My family, my parents, you know, my spouse, my children, everything exists for him, even my boss and co-workers. And he's the Christ, and we need to please him. Our identity is not in anything else. I like to say it this way. He's the king. I'm the slave. He's the master. I'm the creature. And if you really think about that, it really, it's a humbling time just thinking that God loves you so much, even though you're just the creation. You're just, you're so small compared to him, but he loves you. In Matthew 16, when Jesus was talking to Peter, he was saying, you made it, Peter. You found your identity in me. He still had points of failure, but at that moment, he became Peter. And I have a parable for you guys, which gives a good picture of identity and how we need to find ours in Christ. Because after all, he created, we are created for him. While walking through the forest one day, a farmer found a young eagle who had fallen out of his nest. He took it home and put it in his barnyard, 
where it soon learned to eat and behave like the chickens. One day a man passed by the farm and asked why the king of all birds should be confined to live in a barnyard with chickens. The farmer replied that since he had given it chicken feed and trained it to be like a chicken, it had never learned to fly. Since it now behaved as the chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, the man replied, and surely can be taught to fly. He lifted the eagle toward the sky and said, You belong to the sky. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confused. He did not know who he was. Then seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down to be with them again. The man took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You are an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and also the world, and he jumped down once more for the chicken food. Finally, the man took the eagle out of the barnyard to a high mountain. There he held the king of the birds high above him again, saying, You are an eagle. You belong to the sky. Stretch forth your wings and fly. That's a good rhyme. <laughs> the eagle looked around, back toward the barnyard and up to the sky. The man lifted him straight towards the sun, and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. Slowly, he stretched out his wings, and with a triumphant cry, soared away into the heavens. It may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. Or I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> it may even be that he occasionally revisits the barnyard, but as far as anyone knows, he has never returned to lead the life of a chicken. So just like the eagle, we need to know who we are in Christ. We need to stop acting like chickens and live like God, live what God has called us to, to live. I find it interesting that just as the eagle, he's the king of all birds, you know, God has called us to have dominion over all the creatures, and he doesn't want us to just waste our lives, you know. He's created us in his image, and we're supposed to, you know, in a paralytic way or something, fly, soar like an eagle. I don't know how to say that, but... When I think of flying like an eagle, I think of doing the work of the Lord. Just think about how disappointing it must be to our Creator who made us. It's, it must be disappointing when He sees us doing little for Him, when he's, He knows what we have in us. He knows what He's given us. He's given us everything to live godly lives. And yet we, choose to, we don't choose to walk in that authority we choose to be weak and useless sometimes. He has even given us authority in the spiritual realm. Luke ten nineteen says that he's given us authority over all power of the enemy. Like the ego, once we realize our identity in him, then we'll be able to walk in his power and in his authority. We need to stretch out our wings or like Peter did, step on the water, you know, and that shows that we trust him. That shows that we finally found our identity in him because we're placing our trust in him. I love the picture of the eagle because if you notice, they turn and face the wind and they use their wings to rise above the storm. They take the wind that's coming toward them and use it to lift them higher. And, you know, we can even use that in our lives. So I want to show you a video on this, about this concept. So hit it, Kevin.
The song? Yeah, so he led a lot of you guys on there, I think. <laughs> but anyways, even though it was sort of funny, <laughs> it's true about the eagle, you know? Not the screeching part, but just like the eagle faces the wind, we can use those trials and those things that come at us to lift us higher. Or, like I like to say, to draw us nearer to God. Not to just lift us up above everybody, <laughs> but to draw us nearer to our Creator. But the only way we can do that is by knowing who we are. James 1 says to count it all as joy when you face trials, various trials. But if we listen to the world, you know, sometimes we can get angry, we can get bitter and resentful because our identity is in fleeting things. As Christians, we need to understand that who we are directly relates to our purpose. When you guys know and understand who you are, then you'll be able to understand what you were created to do. Too many times do we allow experiences, hang-ups, mess-ups, you know, struggles, we let these things define who we are. The Bible tells us that those things don't define us. We're not defined by our weaknesses or our past. If we had a past full of sin, God can take care of that. He can forgive us, and we can choose to live for Him now. He's washed away all our sin, and now it's time to live our lives fully to please our Lord. This life is a life of love, because, you know, as we all know, God first loved us, and then He also gave us His Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. So since we are under His rule now, that means that we don't have to be under bondage to any of these things that held us hostage in the past. Even though we go through trials and struggles all the time, we don't have to be defined by them. Your value is found in the Lord, and He's the one who gives you worth. When you find your identity in success, then you base your, your value on how well you perform. And if you guys have relationships and you, base, you find your value in those things, then you base your value on the success or the failure of that relationship. So when we put our identity in these passing things or these things that aren't going to last, we become disappointed and depressed very easily. Sure, you may feel good about yourself at the moment if it's all going well, but once it, as soon as it goes wrong, you may feel like no one loves you or that everyone hates you or that you're even a mistake. Many of you, you know, as Mike was saying, many of you act like you have it all together, but... You know, we don't. We don't always have it all together, and that's why we need to find our identity in Him. When your identity isn't rooted in the one who created you, then you just become like a leaf. You're blowing in the wind, just blowing in every direction the wind takes you. Malachi 3.6 reminds us that it says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. He's the one we can put our identity in because He never changes. He doesn't waver. Everything else in this world wavers. And everything else has a point of failure. Everything is, you know, everything's tending toward decay. And, everything, you know, nothing's going to last us but God. That's why we can put our identity in Him and be confident in that. James 1.17 tells us that the Father of heavenly lights does not change like shifting shadows. So instead of being like that leaf blown to and fro, I can't say it, fro, <laughs> like an afro, but, you know, instead of being blown around, we can be like that tree in the Bible that's planted by the water, you know, being watered by his word. When Peter got revelation from God about who Jesus was, we see that Peter was blessed because he wasn't wavering anymore. He knew who Jesus was. And he knew that Jesus knew, knew him, so his foundation was set in him. I'm going to be quoting a few verses just to show of God's goodness and his great love for us because we know that he created us, he created you and me for a purpose. So Genesis 1.27 says that we are all created in his image. And then Psalm 136.1 declares that the Lord is good and that his love never fails us. And then Romans 8, 38-39 proclaims that nothing can separate us from the love of God, 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, he's the one who genuinely cares about every detail of our lives. There may be people who say they care, and they might care, but no one cares like Christ does. 1 Peter 5, 7 instructs us to cast out, cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. He cares about our relationships, our families, our good days, our bad days, if we're mad, if we're sad. You know, He cares about every detail and values us more than sometimes we even do. You know, sometimes we can, you know, I think self-pity is prideful because we just think, you know, it's all about you. But, you know, He values us more than we do at times. And Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's masterpiece. You have identity because God has created you. Before the world was created, like Kevin always says, <laughs> he says, before you were a twinkle in your grandmother's eye. But before you were created, he had you in mind. And he didn't just have you in mind like, oh, I'm going to build an ant farm, you know. Just put some ants there. But no, he gave us each a purpose. And that's why we can trust him. That's why we need to understand that our, our identity is exclusively based on him and His love. It's very important to understand your identity as soon as possible, and that's why I tell the youth, you know, because they're, it's good to find your identity at a young age, but even if you are older than youth, you know, it's still not, today is the day to find your identity if you haven't already. You know, it's in our sinful nature to find identity in fleeting things, and things that are temporal, because our flesh craves that. We always want a quick fix to our problems. And, you know, we're Americans. We want things quick and fast. And, you know, we have high-speed internet and everything nowadays. But too many times we give in to these things, and we don't really know any better. But I think it's because, you know, one of the loudest messages in our world is to find identity in relationships, to find our identity in things. The media tells us that all the time. And then we also have the devil speaking lies to us all the time, whether it be through, like I said, the media, whether it be through friends, coworkers, parents. I don't know if your pets talk to you or something. <laughs> or even yourself, you can tell yourself lies. And the devil... The devil is a deceiver. He wants to steal your identity by saying things like, you don't matter, no one cares about you, you you'll never measure up. Maybe some people have said these things to you, or maybe they've said, you know, uh, you'll never be forgiven, or you should be ashamed of yourself. And another big lie says that you have to earn God's acceptance. And we, if we keep hearing these things, you see, well... Think about this, Satan, he doesn't create anything. Only God creates things. Only God is the creator. All Satan can do is pervert, distort, or destroy things. He takes what God has created for good and he twists it. He can't just come up to God and you know just beat him up because God has way more power than Satan. So since he can't do that, he tries to hurt you know, and attack God's children. And he knows he can do that by hiding their true identity. He does this through the opinions of people. And those opinions, you know, if you've noticed, those opinions are trying to mold you into their own image or something. You know, they're, they're trying to tell you who you are. But as the devil knows, if he can get you bitter, resentful, and angry toward everybody or toward God, or if he can get you hateful, then he knows that you won't see your true identity. Society says, why can't you be like that? Why can't you dress like this? You know, you don't have this talent. You're not good enough. But once we realize what great things God has planned for you, we don't have to think about those things. You know, the devil just uses those things to cripple us. Even though thoughts and opinions are all around you know, we see God suggests thoughts, and that's a good thing. That's called inspiration. We see Satan suggests things, and we call that temptation. And then when we suggest things, that's 
just stupid. <laughs> but when Satan puts a thought in your head, that's temptation. So we can choose whether we're going to let, you know, hold on to that thought or not. We can choose whether we're going to let that fiery dart stick or not. We can control our thoughts by God's power. The Bible says to hold every thought captive in 2 Corinthians 10.5. When we don't hold every thought captive, then we'll start repeating those thoughts from the devil, and then we'll eventually believe them. Satan can, he can just plant a seed, you know, just plant a thought in your mind. And if you take that, and if you continue to repeat it in your mind, in your brain, then he's already got you trapped. You know, he's got you affirming those thoughts by saying things like, well, I'm just this way. You know, my parents were like this, so I'm going to be like this. Or my coach told me I'm going to be like this. You know, you know, we can believe all these lies. And that's what hides who we are. You know, I tell the kids, you know, that God's not just an angry dictator. He's not one who just wants to steal your joy and just take all the fun out. No, he values us, and he wants to enjoy who we are in him. Ultimately, our identity is in the one who never changes, and he will always see us the same because of the sacrifice of his son. Like Peter, it's once we understand who Jesus is that we find our true identity. When you trust that he has created you and that he values you, then you'll find purpose in him. We need to get through our heads that he can only give us value because he's the one who created us and he's the one who knows us. We are his masterpiece and we exist to bring him glory. So before we end, you know, no matter what the world tells you to put your identity in, I want to let you know that only Christ will never fail and your identity can be secure in him. You know, if you are in a job that you're like, why am I here? And if you're just, if you just keep saying, why am I here? And you're not doing anything for the kingdom of God, then, you know, that hurts God. You know, you, even in a job that you hate, you can still be loving others. You could still be sharing Christ's heart with others. And so I also want to speak to those who, you know, who you feel like I've wasted so much time. And we are talking about this Wednesday night with the men's group that even though you might have wasted all this time, all these years, even maybe as a Christian, you just haven't really been, you just kind of been going through the motions. You know, in Ephesians 5, it says that, you know, we can redeem that time. God can redeem that time. So start by doing that today if you haven't. You know, he'll, you can buy back that time. And sure, maybe you have regrets, but once you know the love of God, you can just be that love to others. And so I want to pray for you guys right now. So will you bow your heads? Dearly Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that we know our identity is in you. But I pray that if we truly know it, God, that we'll show that by our trust. We'll show that by our love for you. We'll show that by stepping out on the water, God, that we would put our trust in you to, and that you'll see that, God. You'll see our love for you and our love for others, that no matter what you call us to do, if you're calling us to fix a relationship, God, whether it be a father or a son or, you know, our parents or our spouses, whatever it is, even if it's an employee or co-worker, I pray, Father, that you would just Show us how to fix those things, that we'll be moving forward in Christ, that we won't just be sitting down, staying in one place like a chicken, just eating chicken feed, but that we would, you know, like that parable, be soaring like an eagle, you know, facing the wind. When struggles, when trials come at us, that we just hit them head on uh, because we have you, God, because we have your love that casts out all fear. We have you, God, uh, that is our refuge and our strength. So I pray, God, that you'll encourage your people this morning, God, that they would realize that you are the creator, you are the master, you're the one who created us, we're the creature, and you're the only way to the Father, God. And so 
you're the only one we could put our identity in. And you're the best one to put our identity in, God. And you never change. You never fail. And you're the same through all the ages. And so we love you, Father. And we thank you uh, for your consistency. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, even in the hardest times. And we bless your holy name. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.